name is Matthew Wayne Selznick, and this is Sonatotum, episode 73. my friends on this and every episode of Sonatotum we talk about making stuff finding success as we each define it for ourselves and staying healthy and sane in the process who am I to be talking to you about such things well I am a pioneering indie publisher since uh, gosh 2005 or 1998 or 1989 depending on how you count it I have about a dozen titles on the market currently, and I am also a creative services provider helping other authors and podcasters and creative folks bring their creative endeavors to fruition, to market, and to an audience. I like to start off each episode giving you a little overview of what I've done creatively in the last week. Successes I've had, challenges I've faced, things I've learned, all that good stuff. And I am happy, really happy, to report that since the last episode, oh, by the way, today is Tuesday, February 28th, 2023, as I speak into this microphone. I'm very pleased to say that since I last spoke to you, I have had a pretty productive dare I say it, back on the horse kind of week. I wrote words in Shadow of the Outsider, which is my work in progress, my next novel, the follow-up to Light of the Outsider and its follow-up, the novelette The Perfumed Air at Kiwanantag Bay. So I got some words written on that. Felt good to do that, to get back into that story. I also wrote an installment of the free fiction serial I provide to my member patrons and to my mailing list subscribers, Hazy Days and Cloudy Nights, how it all got started. It's been a long time since I've uh, written an installment. I apologize to the folks who subscribe for free to that serial, but got a new one out there. And by the way, when you do subscribe for free to Hazy Days and Cloudy Nights, you start with installment number one, so you won't miss a thing. And if you start now, you've got over a year and a half of free weekly serial fiction that comes to your inbox. So yeah, I uh, got something written there and uh, finished up a uh, Scrib Totem article on why and how I have moved to a name your own price payment model when it comes to my eBooks sold directly from my site, mattselsnick.com. So that's, you know, I think that's kind of enough to report on about uh, this previous week. I'm very happy with the fact that I got words written in two projects and an article written. Let's talk about what's happening in this episode of Sonatotum. For the first time since episode 10, way back in August of 2018, you will hear an interview on today's show. I'm going to get more into who we're talking to and what that's all about in a minute here. But let me explain. Effective this episode, obviously, and then every other episode going forward, there will be an interview guest. Almost always, it's going to be a writer, author at some stage in their career. I'm open to speaking to other creators as well, but primarily we're going to be talking to writers and authors on the subject of making things and finding success and staying healthy and sane. These are going to be evergreen interviews. So I hope that the value that is presented in the conversations will be, well, evergreen, that you can listen anytime and kind of get the inside scoop on how these creators do what they do. And hopefully there's something in there that resonates with you and has value for you and that you can take into your own creative writing life. If you are joining Sonatotum, maybe for the first time, maybe our interview guest has let you know about the show and brought you over here. I do hope you'll stick around. You'll hear all about that later in the episode. So just briefly, you know, you know the drill. You listen to podcasts, right? 
anywhere you get your podcasts, I hope that you will subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to Sonatotem with Matthew Wayne Selznick. There's an episode every week. And as I mentioned, every other week, we're having interview guests. Those non-interview shows are, well, we rotate, focusing on the three sort of tentpole subjects of the show. Making stuff, mostly writing. Finding success, as we each define it. And staying healthy and sane in the process. It's not your usual writing podcast, folks. You might hear things about craft. You might hear things about marketing. You might hear things about the writing life, mental health, physical health. Usually it all kind of overlaps. This is a show that's more about being a creator and finding your way in your creative writing life. I try to approach everything from the perspective of an experienced beginner been at this for a long time, but there's always something new to learn, lessons to uh, <laughs> to be taught. <laughs> usually me teaching myself usually takes two or three times to, to actually uh, learn something before it, it really, really bakes in. And so it's a pretty personal show. There's a lot of uh, stuff that's directly from my own experience in my own life. And I try to be as transparent and open and vulnerable with you as is feasible. And again, it's all about sharing the experience so that uh, we all have something to take back to our creative lives. So welcome up if you are just joining the show. Let's talk about our inaugural, well, you know, we could say inaugural since it's been uh, five years almost since the last interview guest was broadcast. Let's talk about our inaugural guest, P. A. Cornell. P. A. Cornell is a Chilean Canadian writer who's been selling short fiction since 2016 to professional anthologies and genre magazines like Galaxy's Edge, Cosmas Infinities, and the compelling science fiction anthology from Flame Tree Press. As we speak to you today, her debut science fiction novella, Lost Cargo, was recently published in 2022 by Mocha Memoirs Press. Our conversation, our interview, was recorded in January of 2023. You can find links to all of P.A. Cornell's stuff, including her website, pacornell.com, and uh, all of her fiction that's available for you to get your hands on. I'll have all those links in the show notes for this episode of Sonatotem, Sonatotem 73, over there at mattselznick.com. Let's get into it. Here's the conversation with P.A. Cornell. So I like to start off just by first asking, what do you create? I make stuff up, I guess I could say. I am primarily a short fiction writer of uh, speculative fiction, but I've also put out a novella and I'm currently working on a novel. So basically any length is fair game. So I want to talk about short fiction in particular, but first, the other question kind of related to that, and you can go as deep on this as you want, is why do you create? I can't not create. That's the answer for me. I always have. I fell in love with stories as a young child and basically decided to become a writer when I was five years old. And I've just been doing it ever since in one form or another. I think a, a lot of us have that can't not create urge. I mean, I, I recognized decades ago that if I'm not allowed, you know, and usually it's yourself who allows or doesn't allow uh, to be creative in some form. After a couple of weeks, I, I start to turn into kind of a jerk <laughs> that outlet needs to be there or 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 something is missing and it, it it affects me so can't not create that's really common but why do you think that is for you well i come from a long line of creative people like there's artists of every flavor in, in my family so it's just something that i've always been surrounded by like just art in general so i think it was just inherent in me to do that. It is something I enjoy when I'm not writing. I, I've often done other creative activities. For instance, I've been a, a felt artist 
and uh, I've made things out of felt over time. Um, I haven't done that in a little while, but um, yeah, like it seems like I've always done something creative in my life. And it's, it's just a way to enrich my life. Like I, I can't even imagine what it would be like without some sort of creative outlet. That's kind of wonderful. So in other words, just by the people you were surrounded with, you kind of had permission. You you knew right away that, oh, this is something people do. Right. I hear a lot of people in interviews and just in personal conversations having that experience of like, and then I got to a certain age and I realized, wait, people make these things, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I could do that. But for you, it sounds like, yeah, it was, it was always around. So you knew that, uh, that that was an option. That's, that's wonderful. I didn't have any writers around me really, but I, mm-hmm. I had a lot of readers around me. And once I learned, you know, who was making all these books, I was like, well, I could do that. I could tell stories and whatever, but there was definitely other like creatives in my circle that, that I got to see growing up and people that encouraged me when I uh, showed an interest in, in the arts, especially in writing. So that's, that's so important. Do, do you remember an early champion? Oh, yeah. Um, well, uh, my great uncle on my mother's side, for one thing, he was involved in the arts. I'm not sure what he did exactly, to, uh, but he was involved in the arts and he knew a lot of artists and, and writers. He actually knew Pablo Neruda. Mm. They were good friends. So when I, you know, expressed an interest in writing to him, that was like, well, this is excellent. You know, he wasn't one of those people like, oh, no, you have to be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> like, he was like, you're going to be a writer. That's amazing. And then I, I remember feeling that he would speak to me like he would speak to an adult, you know, with a lot of respect for what I was trying to do and whatever. And that was super encouraging to me because to be talked to that way by a grown up when I was probably like nine or 10 years old. Wow. And he and he gave me like books and things to read that I never would have been exposed to otherwise. So that sort of thing was like super encouraging to me because it really validated what I was doing. It was just, I'm just a little kid playing pretend on paper. You know, it it was like, this is a legitimate thing that he knows people that do this. That's so great. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a pretty good proxy validation. A a relative of a friend of Pablo Neruda said, I I should do this. (laughs) (laughs) Nine years old. That's, that's, yeah, that's right when I mean, you're going to go one way or the other, right? And that's so wonderful right. that you had that. Yeah. So that's great. And and short stories. Why? And I know you said, you you know, you've got the novella that you re- recently released and, and you've got something going on now, but the focus on short stories, what is the the appeal to you of the short story form? Well, what I love about it now, I think, is just the fact that you can just play with so many different kinds of characters and scenarios and genres and you could basically do whatever you want and a, like a novel obviously is much more of an investment so you're kind of you're going to stay with those characters in that situation for quite a while and if it's a series even longer mm-hmm. um, which, which is not to say you could couldn't do something similar with short stories but I like the the option that I can write you know I'm just going to write this you know fun little space adventure this week and then next week you know I'm going to try my hand at horror and like the week after that I'll do some fantasy and you know maybe I want to revisit this character fine I'll do that and write a you know a, a similar story again you know but I can do that in a short amount of time and that just for me is fun it's also a challenge because I I started out writing longer form fiction you know so i at my first attempts you know other than like the things i wrote when i was a little kid like once i started more seriously writing in my teens or so i i started writing novels like right off the bat just to to challenge myself to see if i could write something that long but then since those years i guess probably since the early 2010s or so i started going the other way just i'm going to go smaller and smaller and challenge myself because it's a completely different way of writing like the way short stories are structured so i went to novelette length to short stories and i've been writing flash as well and one of these days i'm going to try my hand at a drabble but (laughs) not not quite there yet and i'm going smaller and smaller (laughs) because uh it is so challenging to try and uh, fit a whole story into such a small you know, word count. And it's a different 
skill set than novel writing because there's a lot that can be done in 60, 100, 150,000 words that can be just as line by line compelling as as a short story. But with a short story, I mean, brevity is the essence of wit, right? And I'll do a hot take and say that you do have to have a pretty powerful grasp and control of language and an awareness of craft and a strong awareness of of story structure to be able to make the statement that short story is trying to make. Mm-hmm. I, I, f- I forget who it was. Uh, the, the quote that, you know, a short story is the most important moment in that character's life, which of course can be relative, but it's a particular skill set to get distilled down to that point. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned, you know, you keep going shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Who were some of your, examples as you were beginning to recognize how to be effective at the shorter and shorter lengths who were some of the the writers that really kind of affected you people like for instance sarah pinsker who's amazing at short stories i love her short stories i didn't read a lot of short stories growing up i i didn't really enjoy the medium then that much or that length for whatever reason, I don't know why, I would just bounce off anthologies. So I think it's more when I kind of started trying to write it myself, Mm -hmm. I started reading more of it. And um, and that's a lot of the writers that are like active today, winning awards today and and whatnot. People that I would um, like know from online and things like that, that inspired me in that way and still do like so so many people like like for instance um you know one of my critique partners Derek Bowden who's also working on novels right now is um also has some really stunning uh, short stories out there that uh, you know I'm a huge fan of you know aside from you know being a friend of his and we critique each other's work and stuff so I mean you know there's just there's so many Something you mentioned uh, a little earlier that I, I wanted to swing back on because this is one of my button issues. You bounce from genre to genre. You're not restricted to one particular genre. So first of all, good on you. Uh, anybody who's listened <laughs> to this show or just listened to me, anytime I'm allowed to take half a step up on a soapbox, I'm going to talk about how much I hate genre restrictions. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so do you find that difficult to sell particular stories, to find markets if your tales are not necessarily paying too much attention to genre tropes and restrictions and and expectations? To a point, like I think as a person of color, sometimes, you know, we tend to write things or like themes or structures that you may, might not see as often. And traditionally, that's been harder to get published because I think simply editors oftentimes are just like this sounds great and all, but I'm not quite sure how it fits in my publication. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, that does seem to be changing, hopefully, (laughs) for the better, faster would be nicer. (laughs) So that sort of thing. But I mean, personally, I don't feel that or at least I haven't been aware if if that's happening uh, with some of the uh, stories that have been harder to sell for me or whatever. But um, I hate being told what I have to write. <laughs> and I think that's a Breach. pet peeve of mine. <laughs> yeah, it's a pet peeve of mine because oftentimes when you're from a marginalized community, they want you to write about your struggle, which is valid, uh, sure. Yeah, but but it's it's not just a struggle, is the thing. There's so many like nuances and facets to people's lives that you can write about. So I hate being told like it needs to be this. You know, we're gonna open to, you know, people of color, but we want you to write this. And it's like, well, I just want to write what everyone else gets to write to, like with no holds barred. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so yeah, so that sort of thing can be a pet peeve of mine, but hopefully that is also changing. <laughs> you mentioned you're a pantser. This kind of circles back to the emphasis on story structure, which is so important on the, on the short fiction level, just kind of on a technical level, kind of take us through it. How, uh, once that idea strikes and you've, you're able to put it down, what does that look like? All right. I mean, it really, it depends on the story. And I know that's like a, a safe answer. Of course. Um, yeah. But um, first of all, I would call myself more of a, I'm a hybrid writer in the sense of being a plotter or a pantser. Um, I'll, I'll do both depending on how complex the story is. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, for my longer 
fiction uh, for sure. I do at least some outlining beforehand. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just need that roadmap for, mm-hmm. for short fiction. It varies. Um, often things like uh, flash, I'll just kind of just start discovery writing and see where it goes. So that can be like from almost nothing, like just a little prompt or something that I wouldn't even call an idea. But it depends because some some things I'll have like an actual idea, like I might picture, for instance, a scene mm. that's going to take place in some story sometime. Right. And sometimes sometimes I'll get that that idea for that scene down and I'll like get to work on that soon or I might have to let it sit for a while. And I've had some like that that have taken years to become a story, um, whereas I've had other stories that just kind of poured right out of me um, without having to do any sort of planning or anything that I don't know where they came from. They just kind of happened. Mm -hmm. But when I do have an idea or a number of ideas that I've been kind of quote unquote collecting, uh, sometimes I'll like match them together. Sometimes something else will happen in my life or someone will say something or I'll come across a prompt or something like that, that works with some other idea that I've had and I'll mesh them together. That'll be like the thing that goes like, oh, this is what that story is going to be about. Then, you know, that's where I'm headed with this. So that's, often how it it takes place for me where it's like the things just kind of come together you get enough little bits and pieces i guess to be like okay now i can actually start working from here and follow my characters into whatever they're going to do next Mm -hmm. i don't work too often in short fiction but so often when i do i start it as a discovery you know as you mentioned maybe there's a scene Mm -hmm. or maybe you even have sort of a destination in mind you know a lot of times an ending will come to me or a scene will pop in my head that i know is the last or close to the last scene and well how did we get there and that becomes the the mental prompt at least but so often it's a matter of okay i'm about a third of the way or two-thirds of the way in and all right that's what we're doing and Mm -hmm. finish it now knowing what I'm doing you know, <laughs> and then go back, of course, yeah. uh, like, you know, the, the secret of the mystery writer, right. You know, it's like, go back and, and then, yeah. make everything make sense <laughs> and make, make the, uh, make everything obvious, but not too obvious. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, what I had planned all along. All along. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Editing is writing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do have a couple of uh, stories I could give you a, an example of how they got done. I have one um, that uh, is coming out in Cosmic infinity soon um, called the bullet in my pocket has your name on it and i didn't even have an initial idea for that one like the the first line in that story is i start my day by falling down the goddamn stairs (laughs) and that's all i had i don't know where that came from it just kind of popped into my head and i was like i'm gonna write that line down and let's see if it becomes something someday and then i basically forgot about it from there i kind of just developed the voice of the narrator and then through free writing, or whatever, it became the story that it is, you know, which is about a man, you know, seeking revenge for a perceived wrong. So that's that's one example. Then I had um, Tabula Rasa, which um, that one started with just like a little concept where I was like, what if every five years, everybody suddenly lost their memory mm. and they had to start with a blank slate, literally, and nobody knew anything. So that's all I had for that story. And um I ended up uh, doing a flash contest where with prompts and stuff. And I don't remember which prompt I ended up using for that. I probably have it written down somewhere, but between the little concept that, that had popped into my head and that prompt, I started writing and put it into a story. And I didn't know what form the story was going to take besides that everyone loses their memory thing, mm-hmm. because often my stories are, there'll be some like weird little Thing like that, or an anomaly of some kind, or whatever, or it's like a post disaster kind of situation, or something. But the story itself is not really about that. What this story became about, that was full discovery afterwards, like when I combined those two things, you know. So, you know, and it surprised me. I was like, oh, I didn't know what this story was mm-hmm. going to be about. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to tell you now because I don't want to spoil it. No, no, uh, no, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I don't know where I'm going with these things, but, you know, they work out. So first of all, the, the idea of the first line being necessary, that resonates with me so strongly. My latest novel, my last novel, Light of the Outsider, I could not get it going. There were several false starts until I suddenly had, if this was a perfect world, I'd be able to say, and it was a a Thursday and I was looking out across the, you know, <laughs> I have no memory of how it came to me or when, but when the line 
the invitation was a trap hit. All right. Now I can freaking write the other 70,000 words. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, sometimes that's sometimes that's it. Yeah. Right. That's that's you got to have that that. Well, that pushed down the stairs. Um, Literally that. Yeah. It's like the thing that gets you over that hump. (laughs) Yeah. And the whole idea that, you know, you got to with with the second story that, oh, that's what this is about. I think that's Mm -hmm. so important when I'm coaching writers and I ask them, well, okay, so what is this about? And they tell me the plot. I listen very, very calmly and carefully and, and, you know, generously. And then I ask them again, but what is it about? You know, I, I'm, I don't I don't I don't want to know what happens. I want to know what it's about. What is this story for? And a lot of times we don't know until we're mm-hmm. we're in it, especially the short form. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. It's like when you do figure that out, it's like, oh, this is a message for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. It's like, oh, OK, I, I, I needed to hear this. And the only way I could have heard it is to actually write it out in in this you know your 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 brain is trying to like hey hey <laughs> over here <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure what's amazing to me is when um you have a story that you've written and and you have your idea of what it's about and then other people read it and they all have very different ideas of what it's about for them and you can kind of see their point of view but you're also like wow i had no idea that my story was about so many different things that's gratifying to me oh for sure yeah that tells me which is why yeah i i I never really like to say oh my story is about this this is what you should get out of it because every reader is it's going to speak to them in a different way or maybe not at all you know Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. you can't control that and i don't want to dictate what you're going to get out of my stories you know i just hope it's positive whatever it is so i try to think of the whole gig (laughs) as a collaboration i stop trying to call it an audience you know your your audience whatever or even your readers i have been training myself over the last few months to, to shift that in my head and in uh, discussions to refer to it as the reader community. Mm-hmm. And I've always tried to promote the idea that readers and a writer are peers, you know, because mm-hmm. it, it, it's ridiculously obvious, but we cannot really do it without them. I mean, sure we could, but yeah, it'd be hollow. <laughs> well, it would be, it would be hollow. And, and yeah. I myself, I mean, w- one of the reasons I write is to add to the culture and you can't add to the culture if other humans aren't experiencing what you've done. I mean, to, to be, to be very simplistic about it. And my listeners will be mm-hmm. like, Oh, here he goes again. But it's not art until somebody else other than the creator of the thing has experienced it. Agree? Disagree? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's, still art but no one knows you know it's like that whole if a tree falls in the forest thing right like <laughs> it's it's quantum art <laughs> right exactly <laughs> so um yeah it, it is a collaboration like you say like you need that and that, that actually is one of the things i would call success when like people are reading it and the more people read it and share it and whatever is like you know amazing i think every writer wants somebody to say hey i read your story and like it really resonated with resonated with me in this way or or to see somebody say oh you should read this thing that so and so wrote because you know whatever it spoke to me right um you know even if all they say is oh this is a cute little story or whatever you know that might brighten your day like just that is just gold to me like i'd rather have that than really any of the accolades or whatever that you can get. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because personally, that's why I do it. I do it. I'm doing it for, you know, to connect to other human beings and on like some level that we don't normally do so. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better. That's, that's the whole thing. I think it's, it's about connecting. I think it's an, an empathy engine, <laughs> right? <laughs> We're kind of segueing rather naturally, which I'm, I'm so pleased about, into sort of the other pillar, which is finding success as we each define it. So as a writer, as a creator, how do you define success? When, when will you be able to say, OK, I am successful or maybe you already can? I mean, for me, uh, success has like several different levels to it. And I feel like, you know, initially, like when I was that little kid who said, I'm going to be a writer, my, you know, my first goal was like, I just want to write 
stories that come from my imagination and put them out into the world for other people to read. So if I think about that, I can say I'm literally living my childhood dream <laughs> and that that is success to a point. But then from there, there are other levels, of course, you know, like, for instance, actually being published more than once, you know, in professional publications is a level of success. Being taken seriously by your peers, you know, is success. Being recognized with things like awards or that sort of thing. So I think you kind of go through these stages and it's not like you necessarily have to go like to the next thing, you know, like, oh, I need the next big, you know, level of that. But I feel like you just need to kind of pause and enjoy whatever level of success you're at. And even if you stay there, be okay with that. You know what I mean? Like I might never win a nebula, but does that mean I'm a terrible writer? No, I'm still getting to live the childhood dream that my you know five-year-old self wanted me to live. So for me, I'm just happy with all that. But I mean, of course, it's always icing on the cake to sell to a dream market or have people read your book and say they enjoy it or whatever. So. And are you, are you full-time supported with, with your fiction? Uh, <laughs> I wish <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I do write, I do write full-time, but uh, uh, I no, Yeah. I cannot live off, uh, <laughs> off what I make on my fiction. <laughs> well, keep in mind the many of the questions that I'm going to ask are, they may seem incredibly obvious, but it's oftentimes for the listener more than <laughs> like, I know making a living as oh, a yeah, short yeah. story writer is, is pretty much, you know, that went away in, let's be generous and say the seventies, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, that is uh, generous. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I almost, uh, sometimes I, I pine for, if only we could go back to the days of like Lester Dent and uh, you know, where, <laughs> Where the guy could write uh, uh, and be paid enough for short stories to, I mean, you know, have a ranch and own a uh, own a plane. And right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like like writers in the movies. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, Jeffrey. Van Is it Jeffrey Vandermeer who who just even just yesterday posted, "I am a writer in a movie," and I uh, I delivered oh, my yes. man. Yeah, I delivered my manuscript to the uh, editor, and he read it on the spot and offered me a. Five million dollar contract, and the next day I was. <laughs> yeah, if, yeah, if only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's more like Barton Fink. <laughs> yeah. No, sadly, there are not very many of us who can say we're in this for the money. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's and that's why I ask that question of what does success mean for you? I mean, when will you? You know, when <laughs> when does a person feel as if? And almost, you, you could almost interpret that not even as success, but contentment, mm -hmm. which I think is is more realistic and and more attainable than say happiness, which might be caused by a moment. Right. But it's so it sounds like you're you're where you want to be uh, as far as, mm -hmm. as as your fiction, and that's great. And I love the I love your perspective on the overlapping definitions the overlapping yardsticks uh, which is a, a terrible mixed mm -hmm. metaphor but you know the the <laughs> the, the venn diagram of <laughs> of types of success you know your childhood self would be like rad exactly which is not to say i'm going to turn down any awards that come my way <laughs> well well of course of course but but yeah but awards are i mean yeah. uh, when you think about it uh, awards are recognition from a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the people who who could be affected and appreciate your right. work. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, and maybe they, they help you sell the next thing a little bit, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's all relative. So that's, that's wonderful. You are one way or another, uh, whether it's, it's, it's your own creative work or, or creating things for others. What are some of your sort of go-to daily or even long-term practices and, and observations and you know, ways that you've figured out how to make this all work in your life. I mean, it, it, the tagline in the podcast is, is staying healthy and sane in the process. What does that mean to you? How, how does, how do you make it work? <laughs> it is, uh, for me, it's really chaotic. <laughs> I think it's like, uh, I take it one day at a time because it's, it really, my situation changes all the time. Um, aside from being a writer, I'm a mother of three. So I have three little lives to uh, juggle as well as my own and occasionally help out my husband. <laughs> but we all, uh, we work together. So there's that. I also live with uh, depression and anxiety, uh, which are put a crimp in my work ethic every once in a while. So it's something that 
I have to kind of figure out how to work around as well as um, some physical issues. Uh, So that sort of thing, you know, means that I personally, I'm not the type of writer that writes every day. It just does not work for me to do that. But when I do write, I really dedicate myself to it like fully. So I'll write in spurts, but I'll write a lot and quick. And that seems to have worked for me. And I also give myself a break on days when I just can't, when I just can't physically or emotionally or or life gets in the way or whatever. I don't beat myself up over not being able to write. You know, I try to do something maybe writing related if I can, depending on how things are going that day. But um, it doesn't always work out that way. But yeah, basically, like self-care is a huge priority for me. And it's just something that I've learned, like forcing myself to write when I'm just not in the right point in my my day or my week or whatever to do so. All I end up doing is putting garbage words down on the paper and I end up having to delete them all anyway. So it seems kind of like more effective for me to just kind of give myself a break, take a day to whatever or however long I need to and come back to it, you know, fully energized. Would that work for everybody? I can't say, but all I can do is speak for myself. Well, and then no, that's exactly exactly what I want you to do because I think that just as with fiction itself, you know, the more specific, the more personal, the more transparent the work, the more universal its appeal, right? It, it, the more mm-hmm. it seems to touch more people. I would love to dig a little deeper on some of these things because I think, especially depression and anxiety, it almost seems to be a prerequisite. Uh, <laughs> and, and I know that that's a horrible thing to say, but so many creative people right. and smarter people than me have figured out that there's probably some sort of correlation but just in the brain chemistry, creativity, depression, anxiety, yeah. they are, <laughs> they live together and they work together or, or not. Yeah. I get the same impression. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So first of all, just uh, you started selling short fiction in 2016 uh, based on your bio. So where were you in terms of being aware of how your brain works, what you actually need to take care of yourself. When did that start to develop in you with Um, regard to, you know, your, your writing practice as well? I mean, when, when, when was the day where you're like, Oh, that's how I work. Okay, wait. Um, and I need to make this change and that change, you know, and, and uh, allowing for the fact that you are, like you said, a mother of three and, and you've got mm-hmm. a family life and, and everything else that, that gets in the way. But, but for that piece itself, and I know they're all interrelated, but uh, mm-hmm. talk a little bit about how you started to figure it all out. I think it actually started um, not so much with my writing. Yeah, I know you want me to relate it to that and I will. <laughs> well, it, 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 it will one way or the other. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but it started more when uh, I first became a mom. Mm. Um, my first pregnancy was twins. So as you can imagine, that was like being a first time parent of two babies is is pretty insane. I don't know how higher multiples parents even do it, but (laughs) so that, that was already a lot. And, um, during my pregnancy and afterwards I developed postpartum depression Mm -hmm. or I guess depression that went into postpartum depression and, um, and anxiety, especially with my son, I had really bad anxiety. I guess I was, very overwhelmed, not just with the life circumstances at that time, but with what was going on in my brain chemistry. Yeah, And because this wasn't my first bout with depression, but it was certainly a really bad bout of depression and anxiety, I did know to go to my doctor and get help at the time, which I did. And it, it took a while to help me cope. And uh, I also ended up joining a support group for anxiety sufferers at that time. So basically learning how to manage my time as a mom and like manage these two little people that you know had me running around in circles and also coping with what my mood was and all that that was kind of what taught me how to do that because I don't think I'd had to juggle so many different things at once while like being like somebody who was who had no choice but to function with mental illness because I had two lives depending on me right so that was kind of a crash course in, in how to do that. And so by the time that I really got into like the short story writing and had to learn to work with that, I already knew the science. Like I know I'm getting to a point where I need to take a break. This is getting to be too much this week or whatever. But obviously I have gotten better at it over the years. But I think 
even then, even back in 2016, I kind of had like the framework for, for knowing myself well enough to know like, okay, you know, this isn't just like feeling lazy today. This is more than that. For me, my depression really takes the shape for the most part of a lack of motivation. Right. Um, I, I know a lot of people who aren't living with depression see it as like you're you're sad all the time, and it's it's not necessarily that. Like I, I'm not that sad very often. Like if you met me, I'm actually a pretty like happy person for the most part. I laugh a lot, whatever. But I often have a lack of motivation, and that makes it really hard to sit down to write sometimes. Yeah. And you know, I do do a a little bit of kind of I'm not going to say forcing myself. I guess, encouraging myself to sit down and just start writing. And sometimes that's enough. And I'll just be able to go with the flow once I get into a story. Some days, though, that's not so much. And, and I just say, you know what, today, I'm going to just take a mental health day and just watch a movie or something and just chillax and go back to it the next day. I think it was Andrew Solomon who said uh, famously by now, uh, depression is not the absence of happiness. It's the absence of vitality. Yeah. And I struggle with it a little bit myself. And I see that. And I see anytime I realize I'm becoming disproportionately irritable, it's a, it's a cue. It's like, well, wait, wait, what is, what is going on? What am I ignoring? Right. What am I, have I eaten? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, what have I been eating? <laughs> when was it's the last so time? true though. Yeah. Yeah. I'm and, glad you mentioned that because like so many people like just don't keep in mind that you just need to like, sometimes it's just a matter of like staying hydrated, eat a meal, you know, that hopefully something healthier can stretch, but <laughs> just simple things like that. It sounds so obvious, but like when we sit down to write and you get in the zone, sometimes like it's easy to just, you know, neglect that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Or, or worse, you know, ignoring those things keeps you from maybe sitting down in the first place. I don't know about you, but I, I find that um, the more active forms of procrastination are insidious. You know, it's like, well, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've got client work, so I will just fill my day with that. And then, oh, another week has gone by. And what have I done creatively for myself? Nothing. Um, but that was easier. <laughs> right. <laughs> because you can you can tell yourself, well, you know, the, these are my responsibilities and and forget your responsibility to yourself, which, you know, as as I'm sure you can concur, leads to that sort of negative feedback loop because, yeah, depression and anxiety can be very hungry little monsters. So you you've by necessity, speaking of outside responsibilities, you know, becoming a parent of twins, that is huge. And <laughs> and but you've developed your your processes, your, your do you have any. And again, this is all specific to each person. Not everything's going to work. You know, no one can just say, oh, you should meditate um, because that, even that is going to mean something different to every single person who hears it. But um, do you have any specific rituals or patterns or systems that not even get the, the, the pen moving or the or the keyboard clacking, but get you to where you can write? Anything that you do that you are able to sort of stay in that track and make sure you're, you're level? I think um, for me, like a lot of it's just, I really have learned that I need to like kind of jump on that idea when I have the, I guess you want to say the, the voice or how do I explain this? <laughs> like, I guess when I'm excited about the idea, when I initially have it, I need to kind of get that out as soon as possible. Like the, at least the first draft or at least like a general kind of, you know, this is where the story is going to take shape. And so then when it, uh, in those situations where it's like, okay, this is going to be a slog for me because today I'm not in the right mood. I've got not necessarily an outline, but I can kind of take off from there. Or um, if I'm writing something longer, for instance, you know, the trick where you kind of leave it, right. you know, leave the paragraph hanging and whatever so that, you know, you can come back to it, to it the next day and just kind of pick up right away because you want to finish that thought. So that's what a thing works for me. Also, just like just taking a break, like I said, um, for instance, like going for a walk and then just kind of thinking about things in your head. So I do a lot of like writing in my mind mm -hmm. <laughs> before well, no, I that, actually that counts. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Before I actually sit down. So when I'm not writing, like, for instance, in those days where I'm just like, oh, I just can't sit down and write today. I am still writing like mm -hmm. I'm writing in my in my mind, you know, and then I'll 
go through like, you know, a scene in my head or whatever, you know. So so then when I do sit down to write, that's I think that's why when I do sit down to write, I'll write a lot and I'll write quickly because I've already got the story kind of at least partly done in my head, like which is not to say I might, you know, I'm not going to have to like go back and, and revise or things like that, which of course I will. But you've got the framework. So I do that. I set myself up so that when I am in the mood, I can do it. And what about environment? And and by that, I mean, not just where you create, but also, I mean, you've got a husband, you've got three kids. <laughs> How easy is it for you to find the physical, the mental and the uh, the solitude, all of those things to get that when, when the time is there, when the, the iron is hot, <laughs> how easy is it for you to have that support and to, do you have a place that you can go to, is, are there house rules like, okay, mommy's writing, figure it out for an hour. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know? I think they, I think they can tell really, <laughs> they right? can see when I'm in the zone and yeah, I'm not super friendly when they come around and I'm like, <laughs> in the middle of the chapter or something and they suddenly want to talk to me about something that can totally wait like, right, right. <laughs> so yeah i mean for the most part i do write when my kids are in school which mm -hmm. of course you know summer is a, an issue or, or right. whatever during the lockdown in 2020 that was crazy mm. but i uh i wrote my novella then so it, it is possible mm -hmm. yeah so i try and do it when when they're not around my my husband actually uh mostly works from home these days too but mm -hmm. he's like on a different floor of the house we like ah, mostly yeah. are just kind of doing our own thing for the most part they do understand they try to be supportive i mean my kids are now um the twins are are almost 16 now and my son is turning 12 so they're all old enough to understand what's going on yeah, so if okay. i say yeah. yeah if i'm like i'm working like they'll be like oh okay sorry you know so and, and 16 they're almost they're almost to the point where where they would rather mom not bother them so <laughs> yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> and i do so <laughs> <laughs> well you kind of gotta yeah <laughs> in terms of like the environment like uh, mm, just mm -hmm. where i am it's important to me to have a lot of natural light Mm. Um, that's just in general for me. And it probably has to do with like just my moods and stuff. I know I'm really affected. Yeah. I'm, I'm really affected by the lack of light in winter. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. So I tend to spend a lot of time in like just the brightest room in the house. And, and that's often where I'm writing. Um, it's also where I keep my books now. So um, it's inspiring to be surrounded by books and, yes. while you're writing. Yes. So I do need quiet. I can't really, I don't really have like music on or anything like that when I'm writing. It's just, you know, except in like rare situations, like I'll usually, if I'm going to use music to help me write, that's when I'm doing like the mental visualization part. Mm -hmm. When I'm actually mm -hmm. sitting down to write, it's rare that I'll have anything other than just peace and quiet. I can't write with any kind of vocal music, mm -hmm. but I, there's an app called focus at will. And it's, it's on the web as well. And I was skeptical at first, but they claim to have, you know, all these different curated sort of looped playlists, quote, tuned, unquote, for particular levels of focus or types of focus. And it works for me. I definitely noticed that it's really okay for, well, for me, it's very, very difficult to get into a legitimate flow state, you know, with the capital F. But I sure can come a lot closer and it probably is just a matter of it's just enough nonsense noise, you know, <laughs> whether mm -hmm. it, it, and it's not like a white noise or a brown noise kind of generator. It's actual music, but just not complicated enough to right. where you're like, oh, that's really cool. I just, what I just heard. No, you don't even care. It's just <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but no, but, I know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Are you ever a uh, one of the writing in public folks uh, just just for the sake of a change of venue and 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 no. that sort of <laughs> no you can't take it <laughs> no not not even a little bit like that no that would just not work for me right <laughs> <laughs> the most I can do is just observe other people and be like oh I got to remember that for a character but right. like, that's yeah about it. for sure yeah <laughs> um, and on the light thing. I, I really need to do that in, in the office that I'm in now, the home office I'm in now. But for a long time, uh, I had, they're, they're the LED lights, but they can make them oh, yeah. incredibly bright. Yeah, uh, I like, have one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, used, yeah. I, I strung three of them above my desk so that it was coming from directly above me. And uh, Oh, smart. 
And it, well, yeah, it wasn't the prettiest thing, you know, uh, I mm-hmm. probably could have made it prettier, but I did notice a difference. You know, it's just, it's close to natural sunlight if you can't get it. I mean, you're not getting yeah. the vitamin D or anything like that, but at least your, your retina is telling your brain, oh, look, it's sunny. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like I, I live in Canada, so we get long winters and mm-hmm. they're generally pretty not very sunny <laughs> right yeah for the most part so yeah so I, I i did need to get one of those <laughs> yeah and, and yeah they are really helpful so the audience of Sonatotum again there it's 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 mostly folks who are creators of some form mostly writers i don't want anything so trite as what's the best piece of advice you could give everyone out there because everybody is at a different <laughs> at, at a different level at a different point doing it for different reasons so maybe What's the best lesson you've learned so far to help you become a writer and reach your version of success and stay healthy and sane? If you can distill it down, what's the core thing that that makes it all work for you? I think for me, I need to be able to really feel the story. Like it has to resonate with me first. I think that you can tell which of your stories are maybe weaker or stronger based on like, you just know, you just feel it, you know? And um, I, I obviously have my favorites. I'm sure we all do, of, you know, the things we've written. And those are the stories that I feel like, yeah, I really tapped into that source, whatever you want to call it, where, you know, my creativity comes from. And I think you have to just get out of your own way so you can do that and stop trying to like, you know, I'm going to, write this perfectly and whatever like it all comes with practice eventually because you learn to tap into that source more naturally and more easily i guess in a way like people who practice meditation the more you do it the more easily you go into that state Mm -hmm. and before you you do that when you're first trying i think it's harder to get into that kind of mental state or emotional state or whatever so I think that's kind of what I've learned for me. And it's always like an ongoing process, of course, but I, I'm aware of it now that this exists and I need to kind of tap into that. And that's where it's going to improve for me when I'm like, I'm not feeling a story. Like I have to trust that instinct. And it's not necessarily about, you know, is it technically perfect or whatever? Sometimes that's not enough. It could be technically perfect, but still be missing something. Mm. And so it's just really just getting better at this through practice of being able to tap into to that and have, you know, trust your instincts and go from there. Excellent. Splendid. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I so very much appreciate that you took the time and that you reached out. And P.A. Cornell, I wish you all success. Thank you. And you too. Hey, if you've enjoyed this or any other episode of Sauna Totem, I've got three things that I would love for you to do for me to help show your support for the show. The first thing is, if you haven't already, wherever it is that you get your podcasts, please subscribe for free to Sauna Totem. Just click that subscribe button for Sauna Totem wherever it is that you might have heard this episode, wherever it is you get your podcasts. Next, wherever it is that you get your podcasts, I hope you'll take just a moment to rate and review Sauna Totem. Tell the world why you enjoy the show and why other people should listen to it and subscribe for free. And finally, if you'd like to go the extra mile, you have the will and the means. I hope you'll consider becoming a patron of Sonatotum and my other creative endeavors for just $5 a month. Not only will you be a member of the Multiversalists community of writers and readers and creators, you will receive all kinds of special access, perks, and exclusive content, not least of which is the uncut, unproduced edition of every episode of Sonatotum. Just go to mattselznick.com slash b-a-patron or visit patreon.com slash mattselznick and pledge just $5 a month to support the show through your patronage. That's it. If you can do one or two or all three of those things, you'll be really helping the show and helping me reach more people with the Sonatotum mission of making stuff, finding success, and staying healthy and sane in the process. Thanks. So what did you think, folks? What did you think of that conversation with P.A. Cornell? 
I would love your feedback, your thoughts on this or any episode of Sauna Totem. And it's very easy to provide that feedback. The easiest thing you can do is just send me an email to matt at mattselznick.com. That's M-A-T-T at M-A-T-T-S-E-L-Z-N-I-C-K dot com. Or you can record a brief voice message on your phone and just email that to me. Again, at matt at mattselznick.com. If you leave me a voice message, I will play it in a future episode and respond to it in that episode. So it's almost like we're having a little time shifted conversation. You can also, of course, go to the show notes for this episode, Sonatotum episode 73, over there at mattselznick.com. Just go to the podcast section of the site and you will find Sonatotum 73 right there. Your feedback is what makes this show part of a community what makes it a conversation within that community. So I really do hope you will offer up your thoughts. If there was anything that we talked about, my conversation with P.A. Cornell, please let us know. And by the way, if there's anything you want to direct directly to P.A. Cornell, I will make sure she gets that. Right after the interview, you heard the little pre-recorded blurb, including how to become a member patron, a multiversalist. And... I wanted to take this opportunity, as I do every episode, to thank our existing Multiversalist patrons, Chuck Anderson, Amy Bowen, J.C. Hutchins, and Ted Leonhardt. Those folks get the uncut, unedited, every single word spoken version of not just the episode, but the interview with P.A. Cornell. They get that exclusively as one of the many benefits and perks of being a member patron. So if you are interested in supporting the show, supporting creative endeavors, supporting this creative community of writers and readers that we're ever so slowly, steadfastly building, you can go to mattselznick.com and just click on the member community section and you'll see how to join and all the things that you get and all the things we're trying to do. All right. I really had fun talking to P.A. Cornell, and it was exciting to kick off this bi-weekly interview series. I have enough interviews recorded to take us into well into the middle of the year, so I hope that you will stick around, that you will subscribe if you haven't already, and, you know, hey, if you would like to be a guest on Sauna Totem, let me know. If you go to mattselznick.com, hover over the podcast menu item there, you will see the Be a Guest menu prompt, and you can read more about that. My name is Matthew Wayne Selznick. Take care. Take care.